Hi, ladies and gents. Welcome to this webinar where we'll be introducing Design Builder's latest simulation tools and we'll be giving you some top tips for getting the most out of the software. I'm Dave Cocking and with me is Dr. Andy Tyndale, Design Builder's Managing Director. Most of this webinar will be focused on showing you the new tools in the Design Builder interface. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll take some time to, to answer any questions that you may have at the end. I'd expect the webinar to last uh, around about an hour uh, and we'll include some time for questions at the end. You can submit questions at any point via the questions box in the GoToWebinar control panel. We are recording the webinar, so you can access it later if you want to recap on anything you see or hear today. You should receive an email with a link to the recording in the next 24 hours or so. There are far too many improvements in um, version 5.5 to mention them all. Uh, but we've listed here the major ones that we think people will find really useful. We'll be showing the, the new modeler and visualization tools in, in the design builder interface today. We'll also be discussing the new daylighting, HVAC and cost tools. We are planning some dedicated webinars on the latest ASHRAE 90.1, uh, building life cycle assessment and dynamic facade tools in the next few months. And I'll give you some more details on those as we go through. Um, we'll discuss in each of those um, topics uh, briefly at the end of the webinar today. So starting with the new modeler tools, we've introduced some very nice new functionality in the modeler. A lot of this was based on your feedback and requests. The main tool, new tools are the ability to import 2D elevation drawings for drawing facades or quickly positioning openings accurately on facades, etc. Uh, selective ghosting of blocks to provide access to blocks that sit behind each other. Uh, a new way to show building surfaces, zones and blocks in the context of the rest of the building. And a really useful new QA checking tool. And we'll take a look at all of these uh, in the interface today. Because this webinar is primarily an overview of the latest new tools to help you get the most from the software, rather than it being a, a full introduction to Design and Builder, I'm not gonna show you how to create the model geometry. So that gives me more time to focus on showing you the main new features. There are plenty of free tutorials and webinars available on the Design Builder website if you're not familiar with Design Builder and want to find out more about how models are created. So I'm going to start by taking a quick look at the model that we'll be using today. It's a fairly typical modern, small, medium sized office building uh, designed for reasonable levels of daylight and it's got a, an efficient VRF and, and DOAS ventilation system. As you can see from the icon at the top right here, this model is currently in the energy plus analysis mode. And I mention that because um, some of our customers in different countries will see different icons there, um, perhaps for kind of local compliance analysis modes. So now let's take a look at some of the new functionality I mentioned earlier. 
those of you that attended our UK certification webinar recently will already have seen much of the new modeler information that I'm going to start with today. So you might want to make yourself a cup of tea until we get to the, the other content, but it shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be too long coming. I'm going to start by showing you a neat shortcut, not necessarily uh, any of the, the main new geometry tools, but quite a neat uh, little tip. Um, and that will hopefully help you create and edit geometry even faster in uh, Design Builder. It's basically uh, direct, how to directly access a hidden surface. It's now easier to navigate to a particular surface that's hidden behind another. Um, for example, if you wanted to navigate to an internal partition, but that is hidden below or behind the ceiling in your current view. So if I go to the ground floor layout, here you can see uh, in the middle, we have a core reception zone, and then we've got office zones to uh, either side of that, to the east and west of the reception. If I now go to zone three, which is this uh, office on the west uh, side. And you can see here's the, uh, here's the partition wall here to the reception zone, which is to the east of this zone. Um, but this, this middle section on this eastern wall uh, is actually hidden below the ceiling in this view. So if I try to click onto that central surface or any of the surfaces on that east facade, then what happens is I encounter the ceiling first. Um, obviously, what I could do is use the orbit tool and orbit around the building and access the partition from the other side. But there's actually a much easier way to do this. When I'm at the zone level, all I need to do is simply press and hold the shift key and then click onto the surface that I want. And that will take me straight to, um, to that specific surface by left clicking. If I want to navigate to it, then I keep the uh, shift key depressed and just double click on it. And now you can see I'm on that partition wall, as you can see here, it's partitioned between um, this ground floor zone and the reception. So now on to some of the other tools, the new ghost selected blocks tool. This allows you to view and navigate to the surfaces of blocks that are hidden by other blocks. In this model, I could, for example, ghost these two first floor blocks um, by first selecting the block. So if I click on one to select it, turns it pink. If I keep the control key held down and click on the other block, I can multi-select it. And then I can use this new ghost selected blocks uh, icon. And that will show me a, a ghosted image of the blocks that I've just hidden. Um, but importantly, it will allow me now to access the blocks that those ghosted blocks are hiding. So here I could, if I wanted to, directly access the, um, the ground floor blocks below. If I want to show the um, the ghosted blocks again in, in their natural unghosted state um, I can simply go back up to uh, to the toolbar and click on the show all blocks toolbar icon and we're back to normal now on to the new surrounding block zone block or zone display tool. 
if I go to block or zone level, I can now view surrounding blocks and zones in wireframe form. So in this example, if I navigate to the ground floor block and I switch on this new surrounding block oblique zone display tool, then I can see that my first floor blocks are shown in wireframe form. Obviously, this is quite a simple model, so it doesn't add huge value here, but in large complex models, um, it can be really helpful to see the, the, the blocks and zones of interest in relation to the surrounding um, blocks and zones. If I go to one of the zones, say the reception zone, I can also view the zone in the context of other zones in that block by again clicking on the surrounding block zone display icon. And now I can see my east and west office uh, zones. Now on to drawing partitions that intersect custom windows. In previous versions, if you had glazing that had been customized and you drew a partition so that it intersected the glazing, it would delete the window. And then you'd need to um, redraw the glazing either side of the partition. You can now draw partitions through windows that you've added to surfaces so that the glazing on these customized surfaces remains intact when the internal geometry changes, which is really useful. So here, I'm going to navigate to the first floor east block, uh, zone one, and I'm gonna start by modifying the glazing. So back to the tool or the, the, the shortcut tip that I just showed you, I'm going to press and hold the shift key so that I can access this east facade, which is actually sitting um, below the, the roof surface. So press and hold the shift key and I can double click to navigate straight to that surface, the east wall. Um, I, I want to add custom uh, openings. So I'm going to remove my default openings and I'm going to simply draw a um, one large window along pretty much the full length of that surface. Now going back to block level, uh, note that you can navigate back up the hierarchy using the links here above the layout tab. So if I want to go, want to go back up to the, um, the block level, I can just click on that link. And I'm now going to add a uh, partition. And I'll cut this, uh, this block in half. So snap to the axis and that partition will now split my block. And straight away you can see that my custom glazing has been retained, whereas in previous versions um, you would have had to redraw that. So it's automatically now been split between the two zones. Now on to um, using 2D drawing files to draw openings onto facades. So I'll start by showing you how to import a 2D drawing file. Um, and I'll use that, uh, we, or we could use that to create geometry or to draw openings onto facades that have already been uh, created. And that's the context that I'll use today. So at building level, uh, I'll first uh, import a simple two-story 
uh, facade DXF. I'll just uh, accept all the all the defaults here, and I'll import a, a, a DXF file. And you can see the the DXF file just protruding from the um, from the west of my my building here. So these um, DXF files and, and, and other plans will always be imported um, as things stand at ground level. And I can then simply, um, or, or sorry, they'll be imported in the horizontal plane. You can set the height. Here I left it at zero, so it's imported at ground level. But we can move those, and we can now move them onto um, non-horizontal surfaces. So here, I can pick up one of my DXF snaps, the little purple snap point, and simply move this uh, this DXF plan onto this facade here. And now you can see that the DXF um, openings there, the pink colored um, rectangles are shown on the surfaces. If I go to uh, if I go to the uh, let's say the zone level of, of this um, first floor west block here, I can't actually see the DXF. So to be able to to uh, view the DXF plan at um, at zone at surface level, I need to go to model options because that facility isn't enabled. Um, by default and if I go to my display tab here and I've got this option to show imported 2D uh, drawing at zone and surface level so if I enable that and then click OK I should uh, straight away be able to see my DXF plan here on the surface which uh, hopefully you can see clearly so I can then use this uh, this DXF plan to if I navigate to my um, my surface here then I can use this uh, DXF plan to give me some snap points to very quickly create openings and if I wanted to I could select um, openings that I've already created and copy those uh, and snap them onto there so very quick way to add uh, openings in the exact position from the plans that you're provided for the building I'll now go back to building level and I will remove the DXF data and I'll now uh, copy some of the glazing that I've drawn so um, if I want to multi-select some of these specific windows some of these openings I can just press and hold the uh, control key and clone those and perhaps I want to copy those onto another surface um, obviously not on top of existing uh, uh, default glazing but if I want to move those perhaps onto this surface uh, as uh, roof lights so I can just copy those across like so. I'll now take a look at editing openings and in this latest version of Design Builder you can edit openings at building and surface level. So openings can be resized without having to delete and redraw them. This is all explained in the help file but I'll, I'll quickly summarize it here. You can edit both custom and default openings at building level using the tool that I'm going to show you shortly. At surface level though, you edit default, the, the grey openings, 
as before using the default facade settings such as the the window to wall ratio option in the openings tab as you should be aware custom openings which are yellow when they're drawn onto modified surfaces are unaffected by default facade settings such as changing the window to wall ratio percent so you can use these new edit tools to modify custom openings at surface level so let's go to the first floor west office facade that we just uh, customized with our um, DXF plan and see the new uh, tool in action. So I'll first select a couple of the windows, just these two at the end here. And once I've um, selected one or more of my openings, then you can see additional tools here at the top to allow you to modify um, the openings. Here, I'm just gonna show you how to stretch the, the glazing that we've selected. So I'll click on the stretch icon uh, and I'll just pull those openings here um, over to the right. So the first thing I need to do is to click on the drag handle and then release the left mouse key and then just drag that to wherever you want it. And then left click again to confirm the position. And then if I wanted to drag it down a little bit, I could do that and also drag it up a bit. And then I can cancel my stretch command once I've finished changing my um, glazing size. So a nice, quick and easy way to start to modify the uh, openings on surfaces. The next thing I want to show you is a new way to QA check your model. From the tools menu here, you can see this model data grid view. And this allows the building model data to be viewed using a grid, as the name suggests, which can be used instead of, or perhaps to supplement your existing QA method. At the moment, this tool is read only, but we expect to release a fully editable and more comprehensive version later this year. You can select from a range of view templates and what you see in the grid will depend on which analysis mode you're in. I mentioned a little earlier um, that internationally we, we have different uh, analysis options available for, so for our, our UK customers, for example, you might see something different in the SBEM or, or DSM um, analysis mode than we'll see here in the Energy Plus mode. So if I start um, by going to have a look at the internal gains data in zone activity, so I can select this template and then Design Builder will bring up all of the information relative to that template. Um, and you can see immediately some useful data for all of the zones in this um, in this simple building. Uh, like here, we've got zone floor areas uh, and zone volumes. We've got the, the template name. Um, and all of the um, useful activity related data, such as our um, internal gains for each of the zones in our building. The grid view follows Design Builder's data inheritance rules. So inherited data is shown in blue and non-inherited data is flagged up in red, as you can see here in the reception zone.
I've deliberately set a different construction template in the uh, or on the reception zone external wall. So if I select here the surface construction summary, I can very quickly pick out any changes uh, in my model by scrolling down the grid. So straight away here, I can see in this reception zone on this particular um, surface, red data. That shows me that it's um, that data isn't inherited. It's something that I've uh, set. So it's very easy to see um, changes. So hopefully you can see that viewing the model data in the grid view makes comparisons between settings for different parts of the model much easier. Just to whet your appetite, viewing the model data um, will become even better uh, later in the year when we're planning a fairly major release that will allow you to edit the data in the model um, model grid view tool. So at the minute it's read only for QA checking, but fairly soon it will be editable. Okay, the next thing I want to take a look at is uh, is a tool that's been available for a while, but the functionality of it has, uh, has, has improved of late. And that's the uh, the load data from template tool here. And a lot of our customers, I don't think, realize just how um, useful this, this tool can be for them. It can massively speed up the data input proce process and can be used in a variety of, of different ways. I, I don't have time to explain it all today, but you can find out um, more in the help file. I'll discuss a couple of its main uses now, just to give you a sense of how it could help you. So the first, um, the first scenario is gonna, I'm going to consider is um, where you have zones like toilets in buildings, where they often have very similar characteristics in, in a variety of ways. So toilets, for example, often, um, well, nearly always have the same activity, but they also often have um, other similar characteristics. So you may have frosted glazing, you may have a very simple um, electric convector heating system and compact fluorescent lighting systems. And, and those systems are, are, are common to all of the toilets very often in across the building. Um, so what we can do is we can select the relevant templates. And in this, in this scenario of, of choosing a toilet, um, I'm going to select um, the activity template and I'll select that as, as toilet. And let's also choose a, a compact fluorescent lighting system, for example, which is, um, well, certainly in the UK is a fairly common um, lighting type for toilets. So having selected the templates that I wish to apply, and bear in mind these could be templates that you've created yourself as well, not just the um, design builder templates. Um, I now need to tell design builder where I want to load that data to. So if I go to the target tab and I can select which of my zones I want to apply that data to, always remember to check for any existing ticks. Um, now here, if I apply data here, it would apply it to all of, this follows the data hierarchy, so it would apply it to all of the zones in my building. I certainly don't want that. So I need to uncheck my building level tick there. And let's assume that the, um, that the zone one on my first floor east block is a toilet zone, so I'd tick there. And if this was 
a, a 200 zone building, there may be another 10 or 20 toilet zones. So I'd literally just tick those off on my um, in, in my hierarchy here. And once I've selected all the zones that I want, I just press OK. And that will load the data that we've selected to that particular zone. So if I go to my level one east block now and look at my activity tab, you can see that the, the inherited template from building level is generic office area. But if I go to zone one, then you can see the toilet has been set using the load data tool. Likewise, if I go to block level, lighting tab, best practice template has been inherited. See the blue data. And if I go to zone one, it's now fluorescent complex. So that's been set by that uh, load data from template tool. So that's one, um, one application. Uh, and obviously this is a really simple example, but that application itself could save you um, a fair bit of time in a large building where you've got common data to set. Another really common scenario is applying data like different glazing or different shading options where you've got to apply the same data to lots of different places uh, in your model. So in this case, instead of applying data to the zones, I'm going to select um, facades uh, or openings based on their orientation. So back to my load data from template tool, I'm going to, I'm going to first switch off any data options that I um, previously set. And I'm going to open up my uh, glazing option here. And I'm going to choose a, um, a double glazing, uh, double glazing with a one meter overhang. The reason I'm choosing that is so that you can see it uh, when I load it into the model. So I'll choose that uh, that glazing option with a one meter overhang. I then need to specify where I wish to apply that data to. So I go back to the target tab. Again, first thing I need to do is just to make sure that I haven't got inappropriate ticks. So in this case, I'm going to apply the data um, based on the orientation of the facades um, or the openings. So I'm going to apply data, the, uh, the shading devices, to any openings which are 180 degrees, i.e. south, plus or minus 30 degrees. So I want to make sure that I don't have any zones or blocks or the building selected. And then I'm going to use this selection filter tool here. And I'm going to apply my data to openings on external facades. I'm going to have a, a lower limit of 150 degrees and an upper limit of 210 degrees, i.e. 30 degrees either side of south. And I'm going to make sure this apply slope range um, is switched on. This basically means that I'm fixing the uh, data to only be applied to surfaces at 90 degrees, i.e. walls. If I didn't have that switched on, it would also apply the data perhaps to roof surfaces, and I don't want that. So having set those options, I'm going to click OK. And OK again. And now when I go back to my layout tab to building level, um, Hopefully, you can see here, in fact, if I, if I just orbit the building a little, you, can, you should be able to see that on the south surfaces here, you, can, you have the one meter overhangs. You can see it more clearly there on, the, um, on that core reception zone. Um, but I don't have anything on the west or north or east zones. So a really quick, really useful way to apply lots of data 
um, in, in tailored ways. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, data visualization. We've worked really hard to increase our range of visual outputs, and we continue to, to do so, to hopefully help you understand and communicate your simulation results more effectively. The new data visualization tools are really good for checking and communicating building surface and zone data by showing simulation results as colors rendered onto the 3D model. This makes it a whole lot easier for you to quickly identify any hotspots and gain an overall feel or sense for the building environmental performance. Um, so you can see here in, in this slide, I've got uh, annual zone discomfort hours displayed internally here. Um, and this red zone um, is indicating significant levels of discomfort over the year. So very quickly, I can sift out some, some really important data just by looking at the, uh, the colours across the floor plan. Um, other examples include getting a quick idea of the optimal location for solar collector panels. So looking at these, um, these bottom two images of, of solar incident radiation, um, you can see here those, uh, those roof surfaces with the highest solar incident radiation um, and you can see the, um, the range of, of um, radiation in the um, scale at the bottom. So we've got these, these red areas of roof surface here, um, which are uh, is pointing us towards um, the ideal placement for, um, for solar panels. We can also assess things like um, window solar gains across the building. So if I look at this uh, window solar transmitted gains in the image here, we can see the, um, we can see the gains and the, the highest gains there in red uh, on, those, um, on those southern surfaces. So I'm now going to switch back to the software and um, I'll just show you how this works within Design Builder. So I'm going to uh, first of all go to the simulation tab. And I'll go to the data visualization tab here, which uh, you may not have seen. Uh, you can choose what you wish to display down here in the display options. So if I wanted to check, for example, the best surfaces for solar panel placement, um, I might want to retain these default settings of solar incident um, on an annual basis. Um, after clicking the um, update data icon, um, I have my simulation options here. In the info panel, there's um, some new information related to data uh, visualization here. So you'll, you'll see any warnings and tips provided here. So make sure you have a look at that. Um, displaying results graphically like this does introduce some additional considerations. So Design Builder um, will automatically prompt you to make any changes it thinks are necessary to display the results you've asked for using this Make Settings option. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, but it, you, you, and you can find out more in the help file, etc. So I'm going to accept the, um, the settings that Design Builder 
is prompting me to change at this point by selecting yes. Um, and having made those simple changes, I can then run the simulation. Just while that's running, going back to the make settings option um, briefly, you, you obviously need to accept those changes to display the results correctly. But depending on, on what it is that you're achieving or you're trying to achieve what the purpose of your analysis is, you may need to change them back again um, because this, this setting may have undone some simplifications that might be useful to you to reduce simulation time later, for example. In that case, consider saving a variant of your model before running the data visualization option. You can then run the data visualization, generate the results um, of the, like the type that you can see here, um, but you can also quickly go back to the original model and, um, and carry on using the settings that you already had. So here we can um, clearly see that based on the weather file that we've used, which in, in this case is um, a, a default London weather file, this uh, west roof would be marginally better than the east surface and certainly a lot better than our wall surfaces for locating any solar panels. Data like this can also be represented on internal surfaces. Um, so if I select here the um, internal surfaces plot type, and then I click on the output type, I can access the, um, the, the range of different outputs um, that's available to me here. Um, I can also look at zone data. So this zone data option allows me to view a fairly comprehensive um, range of um, options. And if I quickly scroll um, down the list here, you can see there's, there's quite a lot of data that you can view at, um, at zone level. Here, we might look for example, at our um, how much cooling energy uh, each of our zones um, is, is going to use. So if I click on cooling energy and accept that, and then I navigate here to my ground floor, um, I can see my cooling energy consumption uh, displayed with the, the range of results here in nicely color coded on our um, ground floor plan. By default, these results are normalized um, per surface area. So it's uh, in, in this case, it's uh, SI units, it's kilowatt hours per square meter cooling energy consumed over the year in, in the zones. Um, if I wanted to do it um, uh, on an absolute basis, I could just uncheck that data and see the, the number of kilowatt hours consumed. Um, I can also configure the, the way that I want the range to, uh, to be viewed, etc. We can also um, temporarily remove surfaces that might be obscure and data of interest. So here on our ground floor, our core zone uh, is higher, um, has a, a, a larger zone height than the other two zones. Um, so it's slightly obscuring the, uh, the color code in there. Um, so I can click on any of the surfaces to, um, to remove that data. So I can um, very quickly um, configure that like so. And I can press the escape key to show those surfaces again. So really useful, nice and easy ways to show some very useful information. Great to aid your understanding and um, importantly, 
to aid your discussions with clients. So, now going to take a look at some of the new daylighting capability in Design Builder. The latest climate-based daylighting performance metrics consider the impact of design decisions over the whole year using realistic sun and sky conditions based on standardised climate data. So simulations are carried out for a full year at a time step of one hour to capture the daily and seasonal dynamics of natural daylight. Design Builder uses the DaySim engine to provide a range of annual daylighting metrics, including spatial daylight autonomy, SDA, annual sunlight exposure, ASE, and useful daylight illuminance, UDI. These can be used for assessing qualification for certification credits for a range of international schemes. SDA, ASE and UDI distribution maps, summary outputs and lead V4, BC and D daylight reports can all be generated. The latest version can also generate reports for lead V4 options one and two. The detailed HVAC modeling tool set has been upgraded to include radiant surfaces with reversible heating cooling, chilled water storage tanks, and three new chiller types. So onto radiant surfaces, you can now simulate a much wider range of real world radiant systems using the new radiant surfaces with reversible heating and cooling. They're easily set up in the same way as heated floors and chilled ceilings by first adding an internal source to the relevant construction, a zone component to the zone group, and then connecting it to sources of hot and chilled water. There are options for variable and constant flow systems. So the variable so flow system uh, achieves control by throttling the hot or chilled water flow to the unit. Um, works particularly well with inverter driven pumps, etc., to minimize energy consumption. The constant flow system keeps flow rate constant via a local circulation pump and varies the water temperature delivered to the surface. And that's achieved through uh, a mixing valve that's controlled by a sensor. The flow rate or temperature of the hot and chilled water through each surface is controlled based on the zone heating and cooling set points. Energy Plus then accurately simulates the uh, heat transfer from the pipes into selected construction layer uh, interface and then into the room. Note that the active side for each internal source construction is now defined automatically. And that's based on the relative resistance between the pipes and the two surfaces, which helps to speed up um, your data input. Chilled water storage tanks allow chilled water generated using an efficient or off-peak tariff energy supply to be stored for later use during periods of high demand. So this slide shows part of a design builder uh, HVAC schematic of a high efficiency reversible heat pump system with hot and chilled water storage uh, buffer vessels. And this being um, simulated as part of a, a model calibration exercise in an ongoing project by UCL. 
There are three new types of chiller that have been added. We have the uh, reformulated EIR, the indirect absorption and the absorption uh, chiller, which is a, a more basic version of the indirect absorption chiller. The slide shows an indirect absorption chiller with a source of hot water uh, and a condenser connection. The indirect absorption chiller includes flexible performance curves and includes the effect of varying evaporator, condenser and generator temperatures. Absorption chillers can either um, be direct fired or they can be powered by hot water, uh, typically from a low cost source such as waste heat or, or solar thermal panels. Now on to construction cost modelling. Design Builder offers a great way to assess the economic impact of building design options, including construction cost, utility tariffs and life cycle cost analysis. Our construction cost outputs meet industry standard uh, reporting formats with options for levels one and two, uh, NRM1, which is the, uh, the RICS method, and also the uh, Uniformat2 um, ASTM method. Construction cost is clearly an important factor when considering a range of design options since the best performing components and configurations are often much more expensive than um, the more mainstream options. Cost is therefore often considered uh, as an important part of design optimization studies, either as a constraint, i.e. the cost must not exceed a specified value, or as a design objective, i.e. you're actively trying to find design solutions that minimise cost. The new NRM1 and Uniformat2 cost calculations can be used when assessing construction cost as part of a design optimization study. The left-hand picture here on the slide shows the trade-off in construction cost versus carbon emissions for seven different uh, building forms and six other design options <coughs> for a 150 square meter house in Catalonia, Spain. And that was assessed using Design Builder's design optimization tool set. Design Builder is the only tool that provides advanced cost benefit design optimization in an easy to use package. We'll now briefly discuss the uh, ASHRAE 90.1 life cycle analysis and dynamic facade tools. Um, more briefly, because we're planning uh, individual webinars on each of them in the next few months. The feedback we're getting from our customers is that there's no faster way to complete an ASHRAE 90.1 Appendix G PRM analysis than through the latest LEED and ASHRAE 90.1 automation tools built into Design Builder. This latest version includes fully automatic baseline building generation with proposed and baseline buildings both included in the same model a guided semi-automatic baseline HVAC system generation wizard, including auto assignment of AHUs and single zone systems. Single zone systems are now automatically created for each zone to make navigation and editing easier. Automatic parallel simulation of the four rotated baseline buildings when that's relevant. On-screen comparison of proposed and baseline building cost and energy simulation results. 
all constructions, materials, glazing systems, activities, lighting and HVAC systems required for ASHRAE 90.1 2007 and 2010 are included and are automatically set as required within the Design Builder Modeler. And there's also linked online lead documentation preparation system for EAC1, EAP2, and Table 1.4 reports. We are planning to run a webinar dedicated to our new ASHRAE 90.1 automation tools on the 11th of October. So please do keep an eye out for registration details in newsletters soon. Now on to building life cycle assessment. Design Builder um, partnered a while ago with OneClick LCA, the world leading building life cycle assessment and life cycle costing tool to bring you a native integration for eco design, green building credits and informed sustainable decisions. This new integration allows Design Builder users to transfer energy models seamlessly to OneClick LCA for additional materials uh, analyses um, to achieve BRIAM, MAT01 LCA and LCC credits and also LEED V4 LCA and materials credits and um, use OneClick LCA's material databases to get a true picture of the carbon and LCA performance. We are planning a collaborative webinar with the OneClick LCA team on the 22nd of November, and you'll see more information on that in our newsletters closer to the time. Now, let's take a quick look at dynamic facades. Design Builder allows a wide range of traditional and advanced facade types to be modelled. The latest version includes a new intuitive way to model sage glass uh, dynamic glazing and also to assess and visualise its impact on key building performance indicators. This collaboration with Sangaban makes a wide range of uh, control strategies available to adapt individual project and client requirements and to perform optimization calculations and analyses. This makes it possible to quickly compare dynamic glazing with other facade technologies such as automated blinds and thermochromic glazing systems. The new load data from template tools I showed you earlier, where you could quickly assign data to various parts of the building according to surface orientation, slope, etc., further increases facade modeling productivity. The net result of all this is that the latest version of Design Builder opens up new possibilities, giving professionals the ability to quickly gain powerful insights into dynamic facade design strategies that optimize sustainability and comfort. Thanks for listening today. That's the end of our formal presentation.